I'm Cindy Kelly. It is Tuesday, November 27, 2018, and I have with me Martin Muller, and I'd like him to first say his name and spell it. I'm Martin Muller, M-A-R-T-I-N-M-O-E-L-L-E-R. Great. <clears throat> so, tell me, who are you? Why did we invite you here? I'm the senior curator at the National Building Museum, which is a museum of architecture, engineering, design, and construction, urban planning, preservation, all aspects of what we call the built environment. And one of our current exhibitions, which I curated, is called Secret Cities, the Architecture and Planning of the Manhattan Project. I have always been interested in architecture. My mother uh, came from a working class family and uh, did not go to college, neither did my father. but. Uh, she, my mother was a very ambitious and intellectually curious woman and uh, she decided that she wanted to design a house for herself and her family. And uh, even on the relatively modest salaries of uh, two telephone company workers, uh, she managed to do that. And when I was a very small child, I remember how interesting it was to see that house being designed and built and then knowing how much I enjoyed everybody knowing what my house was. They knew my house because it was unlike anybody else's and I liked that. Uh, so I knew from an early stage that I wanted to go into architecture and uh, sure enough when the opportunity arose I uh, went to architecture school at Tulane University in New Orleans and uh, thought I was going to get out and go into practice. It's what I'd always wanted to do, right? Uh, and instead I had an opportunity to go work with the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture which represents faculty throughout the United States and Canada. And I thought that would be an interesting thing to do for a year or two, working with academics and uh, maybe consider whether I wanted to go back and get, maybe get a PhD in architectural history. And uh, thought I'd do that briefly and ended up becoming assistant director there. And uh, 30 some odd years later, my entire career has actually been in architecture related nonprofits and I've never ended up practicing, uh, to my own surprise, uh, to a great, uh, to, to in many ways. But uh, I've been at the National Building Museum now 20 years and uh, between that and independent work that I do, I've written a few books and edited an architecture magazine. Uh, I, I like the fact that I have my fingers in lots of aspects of architecture in a way that, frankly, I might not have had the opportunity to do if I had been a practicing architect. So uh, still try to get some design out of my system, occasionally designing an exhibition installation or some graphics. But um, I miss architectural practice in many ways, but I'm happy with this kind of curious career that I've created for myself. So how did you get interested in um, doing a project on the secret cities? The idea for this exhibition actually goes back, really goes back 33 years. As it happens, uh, that's when I, when I met my now husband and I was visiting his family for the first time in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where his father was a nuclear physicist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And even though having been a very good science and history student in high school, I certainly knew a great deal about the Manhattan Project, was very interested in it. I knew about Oak Ridge's role in the Manhattan Project. And having already been to architecture school, I knew a, uh, a great deal about, um, uh, for example, this, the firm of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. I didn't know that firm's connection to Oak Ridge and how important Oak Ridge was in really in the history of post-war modern architecture. I, I essentially came to conclude that this was a, a crucible in which a lot of the ideas of post-war development and design were formed and under the most extraordinary circumstances. So for years, I, each time I went back to visit his family, I kept thinking, you know, this is an interesting place. And I thought about it and thought about it and then I went to the National Building Museum 20 years ago. And about five years ago, one of my colleagues was reading uh, Denise Kiernan's book, The Girls of Atomic City and was fascinated by that and said, you know, I wonder if there's a story here that we might tell. And I said, I've been thinking about that for years. And so I said, all right, I'm putting together a proposal, ran it up through uh, all of our review processes and it was uh, uh, approved as one to go ahead and we started raising the money for it and now it's open. Wow, this is, I love the exhibit. I'm really so pleased you did this. Um, why don't you tell us about the exhibit and, and what, what you learned and what you wanted to convey. Uh, there, were the several, there were several key messages in the exhibition. Uh, one is that uh, even in the most extraordinary circumstances, uh, really during, during World War II, a time in which people felt, many people felt they were fighting for the very survival of Western civilization. Uh, 
Even in those circumstances, design matters. Planning matters. Good design can make a difference. And that is evident in the extent to which the, the leaders of the Manhattan Project felt that they needed to create communities that worked for their purposes, where people would be coming from all over the country, academics in many cases, sometimes uh, coming from very prestigious appointments at major universities to relatively out of the way places where they weren't likely to take well to living in military environments. And so it quickly became clear that they needed to create real communities, they needed to make them feel at home, uh, even under these, these desperate circumstances. Uh, and with, with very great technical and, and economic limitations, budgetary limitations. So uh, that's one part of the story is that even in the most extraordinary circumstances, there's a design story, there's an, ex there's an, an engineering and a construction story, which is true uh, kind of across the board. It's, that's very much in keeping with our mission at the National Building Museum. Uh, but also, I thought it was interesting the extent to which um, these communities really were were proving grounds in a sense for a lot of ideas that were emerging in the United States at the middle part of the 20th century about how we should live, about neighborhoods, about town planning, about housing. Uh, this country of course was just coming out of the Great Depression. Many people were ill housed as, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said and there were people who were interested in, in, in uh, exploring new ideas about how architects and engineers and planners could improve living situations for people across the country. And during the war, they had an opportunity, a necessity to do that because they needed to house so many people so quickly for uh, armament uh, uh, plants, a variety of other facilities that were necessary during the war, including those of the Manhattan Project. It's also interesting to me because there are great stories about how people live and how people create their own community in these environments, whether artificial or sort of naturally occurring. Uh, and that was another thread here that we wanted to explore, that uh, in these extraordinary communities, people really needed to create their own culture. They needed to create their own, their own society in a way because they were so isolated and they were things that sprang up out of nowhere and didn't have natural, uh, natural sort of naturally developing cultures and, and, and social institutions that would happen in a city that had gradually developed over the course of decades or centuries. So that's another story, the very human story about the people who lived in these communities and how their built environments in fact influenced their their lives not only during the war but even the lives of people who lived in these communities since the war. Well, can you um, give us some examples? Tell us what were these communities like? What was the population like? How did they lay it out in a way that you think, uh, you know, influenced how they lived and worked? The designers and planners of Oak Ridge and Richland, Washington, outside of Hanford, and even to an extent Los Alamos, were very conscious of some. Uh, emerging ideas, and they've been emerging for a long time, about town planning in particular, regional planning, uh, looking at the, so for example, the Garden City movement, the planned community movement. These were movements that were geared towards uh, trying to bring people into greater harmony with nature. Uh, they were very much a reaction to the typical urban environments of the 19th century. Cities in the 19th century tended to be very crowded, dirty, not always healthful places, and so uh, really even going back to the mid-19th century, there was an effort to begin to conceive of new communities. Typically these were initially bedroom communities, uh, such as Riverside, Illinois, in which you found uh, sort of free-flowing curvilinear roads and a great deal of green space, but basically a bedroom community where people would get on a train and go into uh, Chicago to work. Uh, those ideas continued to develop, but really came to a head uh, in the mid-20th century, and particular in the, particularly in the Manhattan Project Secret Cities, uh, the designers and planners looked to those as, as uh, ideals of how people might live. Um, we now look back on some of those models and re realize that they're very car dependent, things that we're now moving away from. Uh, but even so, for example, in Oak Ridge, uh, Skidmore, Orange and Merrill, SOM for short, uh, while designing a very car-oriented community or car-dependent community, nonetheless conceived of the town as a series of nodes, a series of neighborhoods uh, where people could walk to uh, an elementary school, to a shopping center, to a movie theater, and trying to create uh, those kinds of conveniences while still creating something that was much more in harmony with the natural landscape. It was Oak Ridge, after all. This is a, an area known for its, its landscape. And 
It was interesting to me to hear story after story after story of people who grew up there, even during the war, when it was a fenced-in community and they were under wartime uh, uh, deprivations, there were so many things that they couldn't get, how many of these people talked about what a great place it was to live and how pleasant it was and how uh, healthful it felt, how comfortable they felt living there, great places to raise families. This is a community that was built under emergency circumstances during the war. And it strikes me that virtually no other uh, culture, no other country in the world under similar circumstances probably would have gone to that trouble to house as many people as possible in single family residences, to create green belt zones, to spare trees when they were building new houses. They didn't just mow them down routinely, uh, something that tends to happen still today. And so that is an extraordinary effort. We, we, we don't have a control in this experiment. We don't have another city that was built for the same purpose and where we can say, oh, that was less effective or more effective. So we don't know. But it seems to me that from these, these descriptions that so many people gave of, of, of life in Oak Ridge during and after the war, uh, the fact that it was such a well-conceived, well-designed and planned environment seemed to have enhanced their quality of life and I can only assume enhanced the ability of the people in the most critical positions to do their jobs effectively. So what were some of the elements that SOM used to uh, incorporate this kind of integrated neighborhoods or you mentioned the, no the nodes um, and how were the um, uh, streets laid out so that they were harmonious with the natural landscape? SOM in planning Oak Ridge, which by the way was an interesting thing in and of itself because SOM up until that point had been a modestly sized architecture firm, mostly doing pure architecture, although their uh, founding principles did have some experience in designing and planning uh, one of the World's Fairs of the, great, of the 1930s, the great uh, New York World's Fair of 1939 to 1940. So they had some planning experience. And I, they brought that to bear by, by really taking into account this hilly landscape, uh, separating out the industrial facilities uh, so that they would be secure and would not endanger each other in the case of a, a fire or a bombing by enemy, enemy planes, for example, uh, or a radiation leak. And then setting aside the, the, the community itself, the actual town of Oak Ridge, and then trying to conceive of that as a holistic community. And so uh, they began by, uh, by coming to understand the landscape and laying out the, uh, the streets in a way that reflected that, that hilly landscape and kind of building the city into the side of one of the ridges. Oak Ridge actually has several ridges. Um, and then uh, creating a series of, as I mentioned earlier, of nodes, walkable areas where people could get to schools and shopping centers, et cetera. Uh, but then also creating a, a real structure for each of those neighborhoods uh, that, that tried to encourage uh, a variety of sort of scales of streets that you know avenues would basically run uh, up the mountainside and then uh, other forms of thoroughfares would come off of those uh, in, in, in sort of in, in decreasing uh, levels of importance and size ultimately getting to little circles and cul-de-sacs and so on to create these uh, more uh, intimate communities in this larger area. Uh, there was also a, an effort to incorporate green belts between the uh, the areas of housing so that most houses in Oak Ridge to this day uh, have a good deal of green space around them, many of them back up to woods. Uh, so it, it was um, a, a not so dense development uh, for a community that ultimately ended up housing 75,000 people by the end of the war. And that's another interesting thing. When uh, SOM initially got the job, the initial target population for Oak Ridge was about 13,000. Then it went up to 44,000, then 66,000, and finally even exceeded to that in, in real numbers. So they were constantly challenged to, uh, to come up with uh, 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 how to keep building the city and expanding on it uh, uh, from, based on their initial plans. The other thing that SOM was involved with was the design of the housing. This housing had to be built very quickly. And so there was an effort to create, uh, to take advantage of prefabrication which basically is a term that refers to any kind of construction in which significant portions of houses or whatever buildings are actually pre-made pre in a factory setting and then delivered to the site where they're assembled. And in particular, uh, much of Oak Ridge consisted of uh, the so-called semestos, so-called because they uh, were reliant on cement asbestos panels, uh, 
the asbestos word, of course, gets a lot of people nervous these days, but uh, the asbestos was embedded very closely in with these cement-based panels, and they were kind of semi-prefabricated houses that could go up very quickly. And the at the same time, SOM was designing uh, uh, schools, they were designing uh, shopping centers, they were designing all the other facilities to create an entire new town from scratch. And in all these cases, they were, they were towing a very fine line. They were trying to create buildings and places that felt familiar, but that also weren't overly fancy. It was wartime after all, uh, but also, I think, very much had an eye towards the future. And it was a real mix. Some of the little houses have a slightly modernized colonial feel, but many of the schools and shopping centers felt very modern. And in fact, after the war was over, once the word was out, the architecture and engineering press, it was, they considered this to be truly a sensation. They couldn't believe not only what happened in secret during the war, but the quality of work that was done. They considered these schools that SOM had built during and then so shortly after the war to be models for educational facilities around the country, absolute models. And some of the other facilities, such as one of the shopping centers I can think of, still looks almost exactly the same today. And when you go there, it feels pretty fresh and modern. So at this time when the, the country was really in the midst of a transition in terms of attitudes about architecture and design, SOM, I think, was really negotiating that space. They were negotiating that transition and helping to define some ways in, in which things would change in the future in a way that we now kind of take for granted. So tell us about some of the practicalities they had to um, confront in design, the whole so-called alphabet houses, so that there were just a limited number of designs to ease you know, getting these things up quickly. Skidmore, Owings and Merrill had actually been involved in some experimental housing uh, during the 1930s, before the war, working with a group called the John B. Pierce Foundation. Uh, which was dedicated to <clears throat> advancing technologies in, in building, but also trying, in particular, trying to find new models of affordable housing. So they had come up with a, a very compact, but pleasantly scaled and, and very, uh, I think, comfortable model house uh, in working with the Pierce Foundation. And they had an opportunity to try that out before the Manhattan Project when they designed a community in Middle River, Maryland for the Glenn L. Martin Aircraft Company. That's the same Martin that's now part of Lockheed Martin. And they built several hundred houses very quickly based on this uh, uh, semi-prefabricated technology and created a, a real community and sort of showed that that could be done. That's what attracted the attention of uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers when they were looking for someone to build, uh, build these houses in short order. And so uh, as they got there, they'd realized that this one simple model uh, was not sufficient to address the range of family sizes and so on. So they began to develop, uh, as you mentioned, the alphabet houses. So the A house, which was quite small, B house, a little bigger, C house, etc. They didn't all just keep getting bigger and bigger as you went down the alphabet, but by and large for the first few uh, they did. And interestingly, most people considered all of the housing that was being done to be fundamentally temporary to varying degrees. Uh, most of those alphabet houses, the semestos, still exist. Most all of them have been renovated, uh, but still, they're still considered to be desirable housing today. They are often on now beautifully landscaped lot, lots. Some trees that uh, had been cut down have now grown in. Other landscapes have grown in. Uh, they're pleasant communities to this day where, where a lot of people really seek to live. Uh, and this wasn't just in Oak Ridge, uh, also in Richland. A different architecture firm, uh, Alvin Pearson, uh, a Spokane-based Swedish-American architect, was doing kind of similar things, uh, even though uh, he wasn't privy to what Skidmore, Owings & Merrill was doing. And so uh, using, a, again, a level of prefabrication and doing his own set of alphabet houses that were totally different from the ones in Oak Ridge, created, again, a remarkably pleasant array of, of living environments that I think most people would have found very desirable in any community in the country at that, at that time. And now uh, they continue to be very proud of these. Uh, Richland has little guidebooks to take walking tours of these neighborhoods. Uh, some of the areas have, have been landmarked. Uh, they, they realize that these houses, wartime houses, nonetheless were very special, very high quality, uh, often relying on Douglas fir, good high quality wood. Uh, and again, with careful sighting to enhance views and minimize views into your neighbor's uh, houses. All this during the war, which is just amazing to me. 
Uh, Los Alamos during the war was uh, a bit different other than the, um, uh, the historic kind of vernacular houses in, on what came to be called Bathtub Row, which were remnants of the uh, Los Alamos Ranch School that had been there on the site. These had been faculty housing. Um, other than those, most people there lived in much more modest circumstances. There were uh, some apartment buildings, there were prefabs, there were a lot of uh, Quonset huts. Uh, but then after the war, um, even though the, you know, this is after the war, it's still a time when there was a great deal of nervousness about uh, what was going to be going on with the, the onset of the Cold War, etc. Uh, but even in Los Alamos, there was then an effort to build some, build some new neighborhoods and create uh, pleasant suburban areas that people could uh, enjoy and really make quote-unquote normal communities. And uh, I think that's what's so interesting is that for all of the specialness of these places, in all three cases, there is a, a a sense of normalcy there in, in probably the best possible use of the term. Uh, these feel like comfortable, typical American towns, even though they emerged out of extraordinary circumstances. So uh, when you visited these, these um, communities today, were you struck by, um, what were you struck by? Having been very familiar with Oak Ridge for so long, I was really looking forward to visiting Los Alamos and Hanford, Richland. Uh, and it is funny how, even though the, the landscapes could hardly be more different, Oak Ridge is, you know, eastern uh, green forest, hilly, uh, very much part of the Appalachian uh, area. Uh, Los Alamos perched up on top of a beautiful mesa in the southwest. And then uh, Hanford and Richland in this very barren but a hauntingly beautiful landscape uh, right along the Columbia River in Washington. They could hardly be more different. And yet when you go to these places, you sense a certain similarity, certain similarities of spirit. Uh, there's a certain kind of uh, graveyard humor often that you find about what goes on there. You'll find um, you know, lots of places called Atomic This or, or, or you know, other, other names that pick up on, on that culture. Uh, sometimes in ways that can be a little shocking to others. Uh, you know, the fact that the Richland High School mascot is the Bombers. So a lot of people from outside the area kind of, how, ooh, how could they do that? And, and uh, you know, I, in my encounters with people from these places, I, I certainly never encountered anyone, encountered anyone who seemed to me to be a warmonger or anyone who seemed to be interested in seeing these weapons used again. In fact, quite the contrary. But I think much like a, um, an emergency room doctor who has a kind of a dark sense of humor about what he or she does, there's a certain attitude about the, uh, you know, certain joking and, and, and lighthearted approach to the very serious stuff that goes on to this day in these communities. At the same time, all of these communities have diversified. They are now centers, they're all sites of national laboratories. Uh, they're doing a lot of research that doesn't relate to uh, nuclear weapons. In fact, much of it doesn't even relate to nuclear energy at all. Uh, they're doing things related to uh, energy conservation, solar power, uh, innovative technologies, uh, new materials. So it's a, it's a very broad array of research and development that's going on in these communities. And not surprisingly, they've attracted an incredible group of people to work in those facilities. And so, although they all come off as being small towns, uh, all still feel uh, isolated to one degree or another, uh, you really do sense that these are special places. These are centers of intellect. These are centers of knowledge and inquiry. And that is evident when you're there. It's just when you hear conversations in a cafe or you see what people are, are carrying around with them, giant uh, stacks of paper and so on, you know that uh, important scientific activity is going on here. That's interesting. Continuing the tradition right. 75 years later. Right. Yeah. Um, tell us, I think your exhibit addresses this, but maybe you could help explain what, what um, were some of the seeds planted by these experiments and, and the, the secret cities developments that continued on and, and were, are reflected in, in the modernist movement? I think in many ways these cities were very forward looking. Uh, they, they, the, the designers and planners often were conscious of the fact that they weren't just doing something for the war effort, but they really wanted to create models or explore ideas for design and planning approaches that might be useful after the war. Interestingly, and I think this is an important point, despite that forward-looking attitude, uh, 
Uh, in all three cases, segregation, racial segregation was accepted as a given. And that's one of the shocking things when you do uh, come to understand the, the history of these communities for all of those aspirations. Um, it was, it was just no doubt that African Americans and in some cases, uh, particularly out west, Latino workers uh, would, would live in separate uh, facilities, separate neighborhoods, um, in substandard housing. They, would, uh, they wouldn't have the same opportunities professionally in terms of their careers, in terms of their work. So it's, it's a, a stark reminder of the reality of, of, of uh, racial segregation during that time in our history. Um, that said, uh, now that as we come forward, there were certainly ideas that uh, emerged from these cities that, that struck a chord with a lot of, of other architects, planners, and developers. Uh, both the developers of uh, Reston, Virginia, and Columbia, Maryland, both considered to be uh, model planned communities from the uh, post war period. Uh, they both mentioned uh, Oak Ridge, at least as a partial model. Uh, for their development. And so you again see some of those same ideas in uh, green spaces that separate uh, uh, neighborhoods. Again, a very much a car-oriented culture in both cases, but with nodes that have a certain identity. You get a sense of neighborhood there. So that wasn't lost in the shuffle of, of suburbanization, as was the case in, in, in many other areas in the country. Um, you also, uh, uh, Levitt, the famous developer of the Levitt towns of the same name, uh, multiple ones across the Northeast and I believe one in Puerto Rico as well. Uh, he specifically mentioned that the construction system that SOM developed for building those semestos, those alphabet houses, so quickly inspired his construction system for building Levittowns, the little cookie cutter houses for which he became famous. Uh, SOM had developed a system of um, uh, you know, speeding up the process by bringing in trades, uh, individual building trades and having them go to work quickly and then move on it's kind of like a reverse assembly line the people were moving but the the houses were of course staying stationary but they were working in an assembly line like fashion that inspired Levitt as he was uh, uh, thinking about how to build his houses so quickly at one point during the war the semestos were being completed at a rate of one every half an hour which is and they were still not able to keep up with the the burgeoning uh, uh, numbers of people coming in and again, in, uh, 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 in particularly in Richland, you find a lot of the same uh, attitudes there about planning, uh, which I think in inspired much of the development, post-war development of the rest of the city. You sense, uh, you, you see some differences. Things became a little bit more homogenized, perhaps after the war. But you do have, uh, I at least had a sense that the approach to design and planning that was used uh, by Pearson's firm during the war did influence this broader approach. It, it does. It seems like a better planned community, frankly, than most uh, contemporary American communities of that of that uh, that type and size. Um, and even in Los Alamos, you know, Los Alamos is so extraordinary because it's it sits atop a, a series of finger mesas, and so it's a bunch of, of uh, peninsulas of development, and so uh, that creates its own unique uh, pattern. But again, you. Uh, when you go there now to the center of town, there I think the Los Alamos story that's most interesting is the, the fact that the Los Alamos Ranch School was effectively preserved. And so you had these kind of log and stone buildings that created a core of the, of the wartime community. They were adapted by the army for their own uses and they remained after the war and continued to be, I think for a lot of people, they feel like really a, a, a real touchstone, a real cornerstone for the, the community today. <clears throat> You're obviously right about that. Yes, I give it a lot of character and a lot of um, sense of a depth of the history that it wasn't just started in 1943 or 42. It was, you know, it had many layers of history. There's a great quote uh, about Oak Ridge that it was a city without a past and it was designed not not to have much of a future, and. So that's one of the things that distinguishes Los Alamos is that it does have a sense of past, even though it's a, a small core of buildings from the Los Alamos Ranch School, but you get a sense of the texture of history, those log and stone buildings, and then you get the wartime stuff and then the things that have been developed since then. And in all three cases, some more typical contemporary development has worked its way in, you know, fast food joints and so on and so forth, but a lot of American communities are wrestling with that. and. Um, I think we're seeing some backlash to that now. Not only the 
uh, the, the surge in larger cities uh, returning to the center cities that we've seen across the country in the last couple of decades. But uh, a lot of smaller cities now are looking back and saying, maybe we should rethink that too. Maybe we don't need a parking lot every block. Maybe we don't need uh, for people to have to drive from, from one store to another in order to get their daily shopping done. And so there's um, a, a growing movement to recreate some sense of, of core in many of these places where that had been somewhat lost over the last uh, few decades. Uh, in Oak Ridge, interestingly, uh, Skidmore, Owings & Merrill uh, now has been doing a little bit of scheming about how to rethink the, the commercial core of Oak Ridge, uh, which uh, very much was typical of, of the uh, mid to late 20th century, and it was very car-oriented, a kind of a strip shopping mall, it used to be called the downtown shopping center, and for people from cities, it didn't feel like much of a downtown. And so they're looking again now at how they might turn that into uh, more of a downtown, in keeping with the original principles of the city, but learning what we've learned, and, and, and taking that to create a place now that, that does have a bit more density, and where people can go and leave their cars behind and maybe spend a day there and not have to worry about having to get in the car every 15 minutes and go run someplace else. How, how are people enjoying the exhibit? What kind of feedback do you get from visitors to the Secret City? As I was developing the exhibition, uh, a number of people asked me if I was nervous about the content because it's such a sensitive matter. I mean, even though this is not an exhibition about nuclear weapons per se, it is an exhibition about the communities that were built in order to enable people to develop the first nuclear weapons. And so um, when I got to points where there was perhaps some unusual sensitivity of, or a decision point about how to present some particular aspect of the content, I found myself asking myself a couple of questions. If a Manhattan Project veteran came through and wanted a tour of the exhibition, would I be comfortable giving that tour to him or her? And similarly, if a Hiroshima or Nagasaki survivor were to come through seeking a similar tour, would I be equally comfortable giving that tour? Um, I have had Manhattan Project uh, veterans, a couple. I've certainly had a great many people who had parents or relatives who were part of the Manhattan Project or who grew up in one of the three secret cities and who had a very strong sense of connection. I've had lots of those. I've had a Japanese artist who has devoted her career to commemorating the victims not only of Hiroshima and Nagasaki but of other uh, nuclear disasters throughout history. I've had the Hiroshima Times uh, reporter from that newspaper. I've had other uh, descendant, Japanese descendants of people who were survivors uh, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So. <clears throat> In effect, I have had a lot of people who have uh, kind of met the bill uh, in terms of, of those prospective uh, tour goers that I thought about. And I'm pleased to say that they've generally all been very complimentary of the exhibition content. And I, uh, that tells me that we did it right in terms of getting that balance and being objective, dealing with some very difficult material, uh, but helping to explain a couple of things. First of all, this was, regardless of the uh, ethical questions and even the strategic value of this, which many people continue to debate, this was a tremendous scientific achievement. And the people who were involved with it uh, were incredible. It, it, they were working against all odds to do things that many people never imagined would be possible. And that in order for that to happen, architects and engineers and planners worked under great uh, stress in order to produce communities that made them feel comfortable for them to do that. And that that is a, a story worth telling in and of itself. Uh, as of this date, I believe we've had over 60,000 visitors to the exhibition. And we've had uh, just tremendous excitement, a lot of, of press coverage. Uh, I've been on Chinese television. I've been on uh, a variety of interviews locally and nationally. And the exhibition has been nominated for a Global Fine Art Award for Best Design Exhibition up against the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, some uh, very prestigious institutions. So uh, we take that as a really good sign that we have uh, uh, really picked up on a story that people find very compelling and that many of them really didn't know about. I know now that the, the exhibit has been extended. Yes. Because it's been so popular. So tell us, uh, for those who are watching this, when can they come and see it? The exhibition is up until the summer of 2019. It has been extended uh, by popular demand, I guess you might say. 
it, it has been very well received and we uh, had an opportunity to extend it and so we, we took that and uh, so it will, will, will have been up for a total of more than a year uh, which is a very long time for a museum exhibition and we're very happy about that and it's um, uh, it's still uh, you know, att attracting groups, group tours, individuals uh, people are coming at it from a variety of ways. I've had a lot of interesting requests from uh, uh, book clubs, uh, not just uh, not just the groups you might think, uh, you know, senior centers, youth groups, student groups, a wide variety of people across all ages uh, who have expressed an interest in, in coming for a uh, custom tour, as well as people just coming in on their own. So uh, that to me is always a good sign. We're getting that wide array of requests. So how many are from foreign countries? We haven't been tracing the visitor sh visitorship to the exhibition exactly. I can tell you that overall, uh, based on past surveys, uh, the National Building Museum tends to attract about 60% uh, of its people, uh, excuse me, 60 to 70% of its visitors are from outside the Washington metropolitan area, and about 10 to 11% are from overseas. So we definitely get a good chunk of people from outside the United States, and most people who visit the museum are from outside the Washington area. Um, what was the most surprising thing that you learned as you delved into this subject? Yeah, you think I would have a, an immediate answer to that. There, there are so many things. Let me think a moment on that one. Well, I, 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 will, I will say this. I think the most surprising thing to me, or at least one of the most surprising things to me about this was really being able to delve into the, the stories of this, thanks in, in large part to the Atomic Heritage Foundation's incredible oral history collection, uh, to hear you know, firsthand uh, the experience of, of people who were in these communities. And it's amazing to me how often they came back to talking about what pleasant places these were in which to live. Not everybody felt that way. Admittedly, there were some people who felt like they lived in a prison, uh, they, they complained about the weather. Certainly for African American workers who uh, lived in substandard housing, things were by no means pleasant. But for a great many people, uh, these, were, these were places that, that helped define them as people. And uh, having known a great many people, particularly from Oak Ridge because of my in-laws, uh, they're an extraordinary group of people. I mean, there are... Um, they, they, they have a certain attitude, I think, towards uh, the world, a certain approach to the world, which is, as I would argue, is probably true for everywhere. It's defined very much by where they grew up in that environment. And in this case, uh, the, the close uh, proximity to these very weighty things that were going on, the, uh, the research and sort of military applications there, um, they tended to take that in stride, uh, and yet they I found them in general to be particularly aware of what was going on in the world uh, politically, uh, scientifically. Uh, that proximity tended to, to uh, perhaps spur some interest on their part in these things that many other people might overlook on a daily basis. And so um, I've also been surprised just by how much this touches people's lives. I can't tell you how often I've been talking to someone, they say, you know, where do you work? What are you working on? What have you done lately? This project, I described it. Said, ah, I had a fill in the blank. My father, my mother, my, my uncle, my aunt, somebody worked on the Manhattan Project, which is not so surprising because it's estimated that a total of perhaps over 600,000 people worked in some way, shape, or form on the Manhattan Project or in a, in a, a way that contributed to it uh, over the course of the, um, uh, of the war. And given that the population of the country was much smaller at that point, I mean, that's, that's not 1%, but it's getting there. And that's a lot of people. And their children and grandchildren, and nieces and nephews, that's, uh, that's a big catchment. And so um, it is just funny to me to this day how often I'm talking about this. And you see the eyes light up and someone say, ah, I've got a connection to Oak Ridge or Los Alamos or Hanford or Richland. And it happens all the time. You mentioned uh, the substandard housing. Can you describe some of the, the housing that was predominantly where, where the African Americans or the, the um, minorities who, by and large, were at least well-paid um, part of the workforce? In Oak Ridge, in SOM's original plan, uh, 
uh, for the community, there was to be, at the eastern end of the town, a so-called Negro village, which was uh, obviously to be uh, segregated. It was fully separate. But, and interestingly, initially at least, it was to have similar housing to what was being provided to uh, white families elsewhere in the community. As the projected numbers, population numbers, continued to grow rapidly, uh, they abandoned that idea. And that part of the, the community was just became another white neighborhood. And at that point, uh, most of the African American uh, African Americans were relegated to a, a whole separate area, uh, <clears throat> which was much closer to some of the uh, industrial uh, scientific military facilities. Uh, and those areas consisted almost exclusively of what were called hutments, um, which as the name suggests, were really little more than huts. They were plywood, they had no indoor plumbing, they were rudimentarily heated, uh, no air conditioning certainly, and there is really just a, a, a little width of, of plywood between you and the outside elements. And even though the climate in, in East Tennessee is not particularly harsh, believe me, it can get cold and it can get hot and depending upon the season. And so uh, very unple unpleasant places to live. Uh, they also, in the Hutman areas, uh, where virtually all of the African Americans lived, some white people lived there too, but I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, the people in the Hutman areas were subjected to much greater surveillance than residents of other neighborhoods in Oak Ridge, uh, and I'm sure that was purely out of, of racial stereotyping of the time, that there was this, somehow this fear that trouble might emerge from these neighborhoods uh, for, uh, full of Hutmans. And so, uh, that was another distinction. Uh, married couples were often prohibited from living together, even though families were being accommodated in the white neighborhoods with the semestos. Uh, African American uh, husbands and wives were separated and put into uh, 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 sex segregated accommodations as well. So uh, the accommodations could be quite harsh, uh, and uh, the experience of life there would have been very different from what it was for the white families. Uh, interestingly, at the, after the end of the war, as the population of the city declined rapidly, the white families were immediately moved out of the Hutmans, but many of the African Americans continued to live there until 1950 or 1951. So it was a long time before uh, that uh, uh, they were moved out of these substandard facilities. Uh, interestingly, uh, for all of that background, well now in the post-war period you have uh, a, a community full of typically very well-educated people coming from uh, often from the coasts, often from college towns, and so they had a very different attitude than the wartime military did about uh, racial relations. And so, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, in the early 1950s, Oak Ridge actually was at the forefront of integration efforts, school integration in particular. And two of the first uh, public schools in the South to be integrated were in Oak Ridge, and that came later. So there was a bit of a turnaround, at least, in that regard. Uh, in uh, Los Alamos, there was probably less direct evidence of, the, uh, of any kind of uh, segregation other than the fact that, again, the, the minority workers probably would have been assigned to the uh, least uh, popular housing, the Quonset huts, etc., which again often had centralized washing facilities, etc., rather than having all of those included in one facility. Uh, in the Hanford area, which actually had a great many uh, Latino workers, they determined that the African-American workers uh, didn't want to live with the Latinos any more than the whites wanted to live with the African-Americans. So there was again a deliberate segregation of neighborhood with Latinos often uh, moving to the Pasco area, one of the three, uh, the tri-cities of the area that includes Richland. Uh, so uh, there was a good deal of, of separation uh, there as well. Um, in another story that's often overlooked is the, the role of Native Americans. Uh, in all three cases, these communities were sited in places where there weren't lots of people, for obvious reasons, because they all had to be moved out. But there were some people there. Upwards of a thousand people were displaced in the Oak Ridge area, many of them people who had lived in family harms, uh, farmsteads for generations. Uh, in the case of Hanford in Richland, in a lot of the people who were displaced were Native Americans, uh, particularly the Wanapum people, uh, who had considered parts of the Columbia River along the Hanford uh, Reserve uh, to be uh, sacred uh, territory, fishing territories that were vital to them. So uh, that was a, a significant upheaval for them. And it was uh, also problematic often for uh, uh, the uh, 
the Latinos and others who were uh, you know, coming from far away and trying to settle in a new place and finding that they weren't uh, welcomed and weren't accepted. Uh, interestingly, in the case of Los Alamos, uh, the, the people on the hill, as Los Alamos was called, actually cultivated some uh, very interesting and, and strong friendships and relationships with local Native Americans and Mexican American families there. And they, uh, there was a good deal of evidence of uh, recreational activities where they could mingle, et cetera, dances and so on and so forth. So they managed to establish some connections uh, despite the, uh, the difficulties of a very segregated time. One of the things that interests me is that I, I'm, I was very much a nerd growing up. I, I was a math and science uh, uh, nerd, and I, so a lot of this resonates with me. I'm fascinated by nuclear physics. My father was a nuclear, my, excuse my father-in-law was a nuclear physicist. And so all those stories interest me, but of course I come from an architecture background, and I'm, I'm also interested in that aspect of this, in the social and cultural aspects of the story. And I, it, one one thing that struck me along those regards that I uh, that I really uh, uh, really enjoyed seeing was a photograph of Enrico Fermi, the famous physicist, standing with Maria Martinez, who was a very prominent uh, potter, uh, a, a craftsperson in uh, the uh, area around Los Alamos. And there's a picture of the two of them, and the uh, their meeting was considered by locals to be a meeting of two equally esteemed and important and influential figures. And now, well, many people don't know the name Enrico Fermi, but of course he's in the history books. Martina, Mari Martinez is as well, but not quite to the same extent. And so for their local culture, that was, that was a meeting of the minds. That was a meeting of the greats. And it was this, um, the, the sort of connection between the two, which seemed to be, you know, the picture conveys a, a, a warm friendship. It suggests that, at least. And I don't know if that's when they were first meeting, but it suggests a certain warmth there. And uh, so these people from very different backgrounds were often thrown together. And that's even true for the people who were in, um, in the communities themselves, the scientific and engineering communities. Uh, my father was a soldier during World War II, and he was from a, a, a very modest working class background in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, he may never have had much of an opportunity to leave uh, the city uh, or the, the state even uh, had it not been for the war, certainly at that point in his life. And he was not much of a talker, but he did talk about what it was like being exposed to people from different parts of the country and, and learning about, you know, the New, York, New Yorkers perhaps weren't, weren't what you thought they were and people from California weren't what you, what you thought they were. And so that was happening in each of these communities. There were people coming from all over the country and establishing a whole new, uh, whole new town, and creating a culture from scratch, and that led to a variety of of uh, interactions and human relationships that uh, are really rich. And I think that's part of the story. That's what comes out in so many of the oral histories, but also in some of these documents, and and um, uh, that's part of the story that we want to tell. Yes, it was an experiment. Right. Yeah. Can you talk about the um, flat tops? Because there is one remaining that is, is uh, very interesting at Oak Ridge. The flat tops, it's so funny. When I first went to Oak Ridge and was driving around and getting my first tour, uh, people kept on pointing off of there, oh, and there's one of the flat tops. And I would look at this building that very clearly had a sloped roof. <laughs> uh, at the time, I didn't realize that this was a renovated version of a very common structure in Oak Ridge. Uh, and there were similar ones actually in uh, Richland and in Los Alamos. And it was called a flat top for the obvious reason that it had a flat roof. It was a truly prefabricated house, generally uh, made in the factory in two or three chunks, brought to the side on the back of a train or the back of a truck, put on the foundations and, and uh, stuck together and there you had a house. Interestingly, they came not only with appliances and often with furniture, but even with draperies pre-installed. You can see images of these going down the, uh, 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 the street on the back of a truck with the drapery uh, already installed. So uh, there were about 3,000 of them that were delivered to Oak Ridge, very much inspired by some similar structures that had been built for, designed and built for uh, the workers on the Tennessee Valley Authority project. So the, uh, the TVA dams of the Great D uh, Depression, the New Deal era. They needed temporary housing for them, and so they, they made these prefabricated structures. And these, um, modest, certainly, not, not luxurious in any way, shape, or form, but fundamentally comfortable. Uh, and you can see this because there's actually one now that has just been transferred to the Oak Ridge Children's Museum, 
And I don't know, if, don't know if it's on display yet, but it was at the American Museum of Science and Energy. And you can walk in and you can get a real feel for what it was like. It was a, a you know, basically a, a 20, was it 24 or 25 feet square, I can't remember which, um, two bedroom house, uh, but with really well thought through details. For example, one of the pieces of the furniture that came with it was a, a convertible dining table, something we really wouldn't think of as being all that unusual now, but at the time was really clever. Uh, that could be folded down to turn into a desk or folded up to turn into a dining room table in a small space using one piece of furniture to fulfill multiple uh, purposes, but also even down to the design of the furniture itself with little finger holes that made it easier to pull it out and push it back in. Uh, just so a lot of that thoughtfulness that went through, uh, even at these, at this, this very modest scale. And the surprising thing is, again, this was something that was clearly meant to be temporary, and yet a huge percentage of those still survive. Like I said, most of them have been renovated, but to the true Oak Ridgers, you can still go through and they'll say, oh, that's a flat top. They, they know it just as they know an A house from a B house from a D house. That's great. It's interesting because uh, the National Building Museum recently had an exhibit on sort of the new architecture for the changing demographics of this country, where we're no longer the family with two adults and two children, but often single people or group living and having to reimagine spaces that can be convertible. And you want to, were there, I mean, have you thought about this and how there may be some uh, precedence in, in the way they put together these original housing for during the World War II that, that are may showing up now? Also currently on view at the National Building Museum is an exhibition called Making Room, which the premise of which is that the demographics of the American household have been changing dramatically over the last half century and the housing stock hasn't really kept up. Uh, we all know this, especially in big expensive cities like D.C., we probably all know people who are living five or six people to a house or an apartment, they're, you know, co-housing, there are people who have um, uh, in-laws moving back in, sometimes kids are hanging around a lot longer than they used to. Uh, all those things are, are, are shifting a lot. You know, a much higher percentage of people now live as single households, single person households, than was true 50 years ago. And so this exhibition, Making Room, uh, curated by one of my colleagues, Chrysanthi Broikas, uh, it really explores how a given space can be designed thoughtfully to allow for a great deal of flexibility. So uh, flexible furniture, walls that can, can be closed or opened up, storage units that can convert into something else, not only on a day-to-day -day basis, but also over the course of years or decades. So, for example, we, we've shown how this one space could accommodate a couple of people, unrelated people living together, but not as a family unit, just as, as roommates, uh, to uh, now up to a, 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 a retired couple, for example, that might be renting out a space to make some additional income. So all these different variations that can happen over the years with relatively modest renovations to an existing space and showing some really beautiful furniture and solutions that do all of that. Uh, I really do wonder if there is a, uh, a, a thread that connects that to the Secret Cities exhibition because I, I don't know of, of anything direct, any direct evidence, but uh, I think certainly a lot of the experimentation that went on during the Great Depression and during World War II inspired a lot of people after the war to rethink housing. Um, certainly in many of the neighborhoods that grew up in the 1950s and 60s and 70s uh, represented a radically new idea about, about how people live. Open plans, indoor outdoor connections, all of these kinds of things that were, if you think about it, the typical Victorian house of not that long before that, fundamentally different in every respect. And again, I think what those experimentations that were going on uh, during the war and slightly after, there was a famous program called the Case Study House Program, uh, sponsored by a magazine in which uh, many talented architects were, were uh, asked to design you know, really kind of experimental cutting edge houses to show uh, how we could be rethinking uh, housing. So this is, it's not like this has never happened before, but uh, certainly the, uh, the work that was being done during the war and again, even before, as I said, Skidmoreings and Merrill, uh, they had been doing experimental house designs during the 30s, during the late 30s, before they were involved in this project. And um, uh, there was, in fact, they were called on by one of the architecture magazines to, uh, at one point, to compile uh, 
uh, or review a bunch of experimental house designs or ideal uh, house designs that had been done by different firms and to come up with the ideal, ideal house. In other words, to pick what was best from all of these. And in many ways, it, it prefigures a lot of what we saw in Oak Ridge and uh, the other communities during the war. It tend to be very simple, comfortable though, you know, well proportioned and very modest, but, but well thought out. The idea that every inch counts and that um, you know, making making housing even during an emergency situation doesn't mean that everything has to be stripped down. It has. It doesn't have to be a, a cell. It can actually be pleasant. You can have a fireplace. You can have uh, the, some of these amenities without uh, breaking the budget. And prefabrication was considered to be one of the, the keys to that. And that's an interesting story in terms of the legacies of this. What maybe didn't really happen uh, after the war was that. Um, uh, it, it's the idea of prefabrication for housing never really took off, and I think that maybe because Americans kind of associate it with mobile homes and things along those lines. But uh, in fact, uh, it, it's still something that the architecture profession is talking about today. There are a lot of people saying we can be really doing beautiful homes while still using prefabrication or semi-prefabrication. Um, there's a spectacular house in Northern Virginia that won a local design award uh, last year or the year before that is, is prefabricated, and you'd never know it. You would never know it. So are we going to continue to build these little stick-built houses, or are we going to move towards something that's more uh, of a prefabricated technology? Time will tell. But I think um, there, there's still a great deal to be learned from a lot of the efforts that went on during the war. Um. One other sort of personal memory is when the Smithsonian had Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian house parked out in front of it for a number of months. Uh, can you talk about that and the Usonian house and how that made a prefigure or inspired um, SOM? The Usonian house was a design by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, where the term Usonian was sort of a play on American but just as American comes from America, Usonian came from USA. That was the origin of that term. And his goal was to create uh, a, a family of houses that were uh, affordable, but that, that were absolutely representative of the best of design, where you know, everything worked together. They were conceived as total works of art. The, the German word was the Gesamtkunstwerk. And that was, um, uh, a, 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 I think, a real seminal moment in the early 20th century for, uh, for in the history of American architecture, of, of coming up with something that felt uniquely American. Uh, much of what had been done, particularly in the public realm or commercial architecture up until that point in the United States, was very, owed a great debt to European precedents. Uh, ancient Greek architecture, Roman architecture, Renaissance, Gothic, those were the things from which we drew. And Wright was very interested in creating a truly American, a Usonian architecture. And so uh, a lot of these houses were very modest, uh, but they, they'd have a way not, of not feeling that way because they have these, you know, these details, this the character of materials and so on that really made them feel very rich and often very site specific. So this wasn't a one size fits all uh, approach. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't even about prefabrication per se. What it was about was an attitude of, of creating uh, kind of a family of houses that, that uh, reflected different needs, could be accommodated, uh, fit to different sites, but were all based on uh, sort of similar ideas. Uh, it's interesting that the, the ar architects from SOM, uh, they described the early stages of their design process, Oak Ridge, is, is uh, involving looking at a lot of other examples. Not only Wright, Le Corbusier, the Swiss-French architect who was so influential, uh, the Bauhaus, the famous German school uh, that, that uh, was very much associated not only with kind of uh, creating uh, sort of pure rational forms, but also uh, very much with a social housing component. There was a strong uh, uh, social component to the Bauhaus's curriculum. So they looked at all of those, and what they ended up concluding was that, yeah, all, all that, that's interesting, but for us, we really need to get down there and solve some specific problems. We know, we, we have enough, um, we have kind of enough criteria, enough uh, information to go on based on what the Army Corps of Engineers needs, what the site requires, what we can get to the site, how fast we can get it to the site. It was a very um, kind of rational problem-solving process in many ways. 
And so ultimately they looked less for some of these more theoretical and, and uh, academic models and much more at the specifics of what they were asked to do. And so as they went through time, they, that's when they really, I think, began to develop more and more of their own voice and a much more practical approach uh, to, to this. And uh, one of the things I argue in terms of the legacy of the Manhattan Project is that largely because of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and I, you'll find that I do often talk a, a good deal more about Oak Ridge than I do the other two, that is because for our purposes, SOM, their role really was the, uh, the most significant story to come out of this in terms of architecture and engineering and construction. And I argue that this was basically the, the foundation of the modern multidisciplinary design firm because they went into it uh, being hired because they had designed a little experimental house. And by the end, they had done a whole town plan, they had done civil engineering, they had, st had staked out where all the roads would go, they had done the drawings for where all the, all the sewers and water uh, would go, where all the electrical power would go. They had done civil engineering, structural engineering, urban planning, some, just some, some aspects of landscape architecture as well as architecture. And that laid the groundwork for much of what we now take for granted, these multidiscipl multidisciplinary kind of corporate architecture and design firms that uh, are now the kind of the, uh, the main approach to practice for, uh, for commercial projects, civic projects, even a great many residential projects. So uh, that seems to be one of the key legacies of the Manhattan Project from, in terms of the mission of the National Building Museum. That's interesting, yeah. Can you describe, um, you know, how many people did they have, what were they told about the site in which they were to construct, and how much time did they have to do all this? There's a great story uh, that supposedly one day in, uh, I guess it would have been 1942, uh, two men in plain clothes came into the SOM office in New York. At that time, they already had offices in Chicago and New York. Said they wanted to speak with uh, Skidmore, uh, the S of SOM. And once they got in, they said, we would like you to design an entire town for us with no explanation. And of course, this is coming at the end of the Great Depression, where many architects were happy to design a doghouse. And all of a sudden, we want you to design a whole town. Yeah, sure you do. <laughs> there was great skepticism at first before it became apparent that this was real. And uh, once um, uh, it, it was ev evident that this was a real project, and they began to uh, figure out how to do it, go about it, as they as you might expect, they asked for topographical drawings and other information, and they said, yeah, we can't give you that. So they said, all right, you want us to design a community, you want us to design housing and then a plan, and we can't know what we're working on? Obviously, that's not going to work. So eventually, they got some unlabeled drawings that at least gave them some information about the topography. And supposedly, it was only when John Merrill, the M of SOM, showed up with a few colleagues one day at Penn Station in New York, prepared to get on a train, he didn't know where he was going until someone handed him a ticket when he found out he was going to Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, which is it's near the site of Oak Ridge. And so uh, it was a constant struggle of them trying to get adequate information to do the project that they needed to do. Uh, going into the war, SOM had, depending upon to whom you talk, had something on the order of maybe 60 to 90 employees between the two offices. And again, depending upon the figures you, you, you uh, believe, you know, there's different variations on this, uh, it, it seems that by the end of the war they had something like 650 people. So the firm had grown to a previously unimaginable size very quickly as they brought in people to, uh, to do all this work in, in very short order. And the other interesting thing, and this f fits into my comment about uh, kind of a setting precedence for the modern multidisciplinary architecture and design firm. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers kept on asking SOM to do things that SOM didn't really have any experience doing. And uh, as, Nat, as Nat Owings, the O of SOM said, it's like, well, we just kept on saying, yes, we can do that. And then after that, they'd figure out how to do it. And in a way, that, that's not quite as ludicrous as it may seem because in a sense, architects do this all the time. Every single day in an architecture of practice, you're doing things you don't know how to do because that's the nature of architectural practice. And so in this case, there's like, well, we need you to figure out how many shops there are going to be, how many beauty parlors, how many barber shops, how many pharmacies, 
how do you do that? No one had done that kind of work before. So they said, yeah, we can do that. And they went back and they realized that one of their hometowns uh, in Indiana actually had about the same population as the target size of Oak Ridge. So they said, all right, let's go there and we'll count. And we'll divide it up by population and say, all right, we need 0 .006 barber chairs per, popul per resident. And so they, they, they turned it into a science. And that's part of what design is. It's not just making the pretty sketch on the napkin, which is a very small part of it, and probably not on a napkin, but it's also figuring out the program. It's also figuring out um, how to uh, accommodate the program within the, the bounds of, of zoning codes and accessibility codes and uh, energy consumption criteria, all, all these sorts of things that architects are routinely considering. And so, in a way, this was perfectly natural, but there was a good deal of chutzpah on the part of, of SOM to come in and say, all right, we may not know, we're going to tell them we can do it, and then we'll figure it out. And they did. And so, when they needed to help with uh, retail operations, they hired a former head of a department store chain to come in and advise them. They, brought, they bought an entire construction company and brought them down to help them do the work they needed to do. Whenever they didn't have the resource, they identified what the need was and found it and brought it to bear. And so it was, it was at a scale that was probably shocking for many of the people involved, but that sort of work is again something that to me, in my mind, happens a lot on an, on an ongoing basis in modern architectural practice. Uh, so uh, they, they worked very quickly and, and certainly within a matter of months had uh, developed initial plans, initial designs for houses, and were well underway. Uh, a, a, a speed of, of construction that now would be uh, hard to imagine. And again, similar things going on with, um, uh, particularly with Richland and Alvin Pearson. Uh, he was uh, a similarly uh, uh, resourceful person, figuring out what he needed and how to, to, to uh, bring it to bear. and. Uh, also insisting on quality. It's very clear from the documents that um, uh, Pearson was very active in resisting any efforts on the part of the, of the, of the army to say, well, can we make this cheaper? Can we, can we simplify this? And he said, to a certain point, but then no. We want these to stand up. These, these people have important jobs. We want them to be well housed. We want them to be comfortable. We want them to be safe. This is what we need. And he insisted on that throughout. And so, uh, it, it, it's, it's part of the story that this was uh, architects fulfilling their role of kind of um, uh, you know, defenders of quality and, and saying this is what it takes in order to achieve your long goals. You, you can always cut down, you can always make it cheaper, but eventually it's, it's a diminishing return. So they were building for the duration, not just for the war effort. There's a good deal of, of, in, of uh, information that indicates that people were thinking of these towns as being temporary. And yet, when you look at the quality of, of material that was going into some of these, particularly in Richland with the Dul Douglas fir uh, uh, wood being used in the houses, these were not things that people thought were going to be torn down in a, in a year or two. Uh, so some of them more so, the, the flat tops and some of the other uh, manufactured housing, the hutments clearly, uh, those were all designed to be very temporary. But uh, I think anyone who, who really thought it through realized that even if, if the Manhattan Project achieved its goal, whatever it was, since of course the architects and engineers didn't know what it was, many of the people working on the project didn't know what it was. Um, but everybody hoped and assumed that the war would be over in a year or two. That's what wars were like in those days. Uh, they tend to be very definitive. You had a start, there was a declaration of war, you had a treaty, that was the end of the war. And so there was an assumption that that would come in a year or two or three or whatever it might be. And so, but they knew that all of that operation, something of that scale, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be shut down right away. And so uh, I don't think anyone could have looked ahead to the Cold War and realized that these cities would actually then find renewed purpose just a few years after the end of World War II. Uh, but still, they had to know that there was going to be some demand. You can't just build a town and have 75,000 people occupied, in the case of Oak Ridge, and expect them all to leave the next day after the treaty is signed, the armistice. So, um, but still, uh, part of it is just a sign of uh, the fact that even for relatively disposable things in those days, the quality of material was pretty good. You know, we, we were working, you know what you're working with, with good quality wood and good quality uh, 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 materials besides that that often uh, really managed to, to uh, yield buildings of great quality.